much for your kind introduction. It's very interesting to hear people talk about you. <laughs> and then you say, is this me? Uh, I always like to record that. I hope you recorded this uh, introduction <laughs> because then I play it to my mother-in-law. <laughs> and when she's always wondering what mistake her daughter made to marry me. So anyway, but I want to tell you one thing that is important to understand as a student of ESSEC that there's a profound connection, we're talking about innovation, there's a profound connection between the strategy of a government and what happens in terms of innovation. You cannot separate the two. In fact, the NIH and its counterpart, the National Science Foundation, NIH is for health and biomedical research, NSF is for everything else, physical sciences and so on, were created at the end of the Second World War by President Roosevelt. And you know why he created it? Because he noticed himself. He saw how important was the combination between industry, universities, and the government. That the progress we've made is enough. We need to make more progress in what I call a systems approach to science. Okay? Just like I said, innovation is part of the system. It's pretty likely that diseases are part of a system of disorders, not one disorder. There won't be one cause, one disease. It's going to be balanced between different things. So it's a systematic approach and you're not surprised I and mean, this is the way life is. It's very complex. So let me go and show you one thing that since this is the Sanofi Aventus chair, I have to show you this statistic. These are the number of, of new drugs approved by the FDA. The FDA is the Food and Drug Administration. And I'm sure you've heard about this. If you look at the, what we call NME, which is in light blue, new molecular entities, these are molecular constructs that didn't exist before. They've been made uh, by us, by humans. And, you know, it's 53, 96, and then look at the number. And many of these new molecular entities are not totally original. They're sometimes variations of, of an existing one. So clearly we're not producing as many even though we're investing much more. I showed you the slide. Uh, the private industry invests twice as much as the NIH in biomedical research. We spent about 30 billion, this, they spent 60 billion. So suppose that today you were coming from a spaceship and you didn't know anything about the Earth and you didn't know there was a civilization. This is a million through a billion year from now, let's say. And you come in and you search the ESSEC and you find this computer and you undo the computer and you look at the chip inside that computer, the in Intel inside thing, and you put your scientists, you say, well, let's understand what these humans were doing at that time. What would you do? How would you do that? Yeah, you probably look at the chip, you look at microscope, and you start away to identify the elements of the chip. And then maybe after 50 years of research, you might decide that, yeah, this is a, a, a resistance, this is a transistor, and you may end up with a good description of all the elements of a chip. But does that tell you how a PowerPoint presentation was made? Or how a word-perfect document is made? It doesn't. It's the same thing in biology. Over the past 50 years, what we've done, we've understood DNA and RNA, and proteins and receptors and all kinds of elements of the system. And we're now starting to map it. So this, for example, is just what we know about a cell responding to damage like heat or radiation, whatever. And you can see, uh, I mean, it's pretty interesting. I mean, we have the elements and the proteins. We know that they have somehow relate to each other in some fashion. And this is just one piece of biology. In fact, you know we have 24,000 genes, but these 24,000 genes code for a million proteins. In every cell, you have the possibility of having a million different components. And the problem is we don't really know how they all interact, and how they interrelate, and we're working on that. This is the key, key frontier of science today. So what I always tell people in strategy and in innovation, thinking science or business, Remember one rule, the Zerhuni rule. That is that you always try to find a way to be at the table. 
because if you don't, you'll be on the menu. <laughs> that's the idea. And that's really what's happening right now. So everything is sort of shifting, and innovation is going to be very important to continue to be at the table. So thank you for this brilliant, <coughs> energetic, and charismatic talk. Uh, now, let's start question and answers, uh, at least questions. Um, as always, the first question is the most difficult one. So I suggest you to start to the second question directly. <laughs> now, who has the second question? Medical science frequently looks for new treatments for diseases, but your experience at the beginning of your career tells us that there is another path as well, and that is when not to treat in the case of, of calcium in the lung. Is there a substantial cost-saving potential for technologies that would, for example, look at the genetic characteristics of tumors, uh, which tumors of the breast or the prostate are aggressive and need intervention, and which tumors are perhaps right. less aggressive and watchful waiting would be, would be useful. Right. Perhaps we, we can save money by doing less treatment instead of more. Well, that's an excellent question. That's actually why personalized medicine is being developed. It, the personalized medicine has two goals, to ba basically identify what's the best treatment and avoid what's not good for you. One time I, I testified and I said, listen, here's the situation. NIH is wonderful because when you have a successful organization, it's even more difficult to reform it because NIH is a very, very prestigious success. For those of you who know the NIH in the U.S., it's considered one of the best federal agencies. And therefore, how do you provoke change, right? And I testified right in Congress with the cameras and so on. It's a pretty big show. And uh, I said, look, here is what it is. We have a great organization because the first question I had was, why do you want to reform the NIH? It's been wonderful. What's your problem? Is just because you're the director, that's it, you want to change? And um, the senator asked me that question. I said, look, look, senator, the NIH is wonderful. It has 27 very strong fingers, but it has no palm. And that doesn't make a strong hand. You know, that sentence made the reform pass. That single 10-second thing, when I told him, and I showed my hand, I said, it's like 27 very strong fingers, but there's no palm. There's no integration. There's no multidisciplinary. There's no common uh, core that makes it look coordinated and more co in coordination. They got it. And then every time I would go, Dr. Zerny, I remember when you said that the NIH was 27 fingers without no palm. <laughs> we have to fix that. <laughs> so, I'm a PhD student working on healthcare risk analysis. Um, I feel somehow outlier because I'm, most of the people here are healthcare specialists, which I'm not. I'm in decision analysis and decision science. And mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm using a very specific uh, methodology to risk healthcare risk analysis, which is causality or causal Bayesian networks. So my question is, how do you see the research area in this, in this this field and a person as humble and ambitious as you, what do you remind yourself of each morning when you wake up? <laughs> to shave. <laughs> the second is that the doors to success are very narrow. And typically what happens is your first success, people I've seen that, I've seen good colleagues who are smart, smarter than me who basically have the first success and their head swells up. So they can't let, cannot go through the next door. <laughs> so remember, the gates to success are very narrow. And if you let your head swells up, swell up in the morning, you'll never get through. Thank you very much.